I'm going to read from the first chapter of the book of Acts. And the first 11 verses. Acts chapter 1. Verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he chosen. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner ye have seen him go into heaven. God will bless the preaching and the reading of his word. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity for us to have the word of God open. And I pray, Lord, you will just bless the preaching of the word and may we hear that other voice in the preaching. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I've been reading this week one of Spurgeon's sermon, which he called The Greatest Fight in the World. He speaks of the armory which is available to the Christian, and he says, we will begin with our armory. That armory to me, at any rate, and hope it is to each one of you, the Bible. To us, the Holy Scripture is as the Tower of David, builded for an armory, whereon there hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. If we want weapons, we must come here for them, and here only, whether we seek the sword of offense or the sword of defense. We must find it within the volume of inspiration, the Word of God. If others have any other storehouses, I confess at once, I have none. I have nothing else to preach when I have got through with this book. Indeed, I can have no wish to preach at all if I may not continue to expound the subjects which I find in these pages. What else is worth preaching? The truth of God is the only treasure for which we seek and the scripture is the only field in which we dig for it. I think they're lovely words. And uh, I think in our passage here, there's something quite pleasant when we read of people right with Jesus on a walk. To go for a walk with friends, to stroll, to chat, to have fellowship one with another. But it's not just any walk, this was a walk where the disciples were dis instructed in the things of God by the Lord. Luke tells us here in verse 1 
that he writes so that we can know something of all that Jesus began to do and teach. Do you know, it's always a beneficial thing to walk with the Lord. It's only then when we walk with him that we walk with the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Without the way, there's no going. And without the truth, there's no knowing. And without the life, there is no living. I've had many walks over my life with people, as I'm sure you have, of people of all ages, different nationalities, sharing experiences and their trials, and it can be a blessing to us. But here we have a walk like none other. A meeting which is unique, and it ends up on Mount Olivet, the Mount of Olives, not far from Jerusalem. In fact, the next verse there, verse 12, says it was a Sabbath day's journey from Jerusalem, just beyond the, the Kidron Valley. Barnes says in his commentary, he says, well, a Sabbath day's journey, that was as far as might be lawfully traveled by a Jew on the Sabbath this was 2,000 paces or cubits, or seven furlongs and a half, not quite a mile. It was a remarkable walk. It's something worth thinking about. Not only are they with Jesus, the one who they'd followed for three years, but they were walking with their master, Jesus, who'd been crucified and murdered. And now he's risen from the dead. How on earth do you get your head around that? Can I ask you, in your experience and in your lifetime, have you ever been for a walk with someone who'd been murdered? I've never been for a walk like that. What a change these weeks had brought these men and those that followed Jesus. What a change from gloom, despondency, fear, to rejoicing, expectant hearts. I think the word overwhelm comes to my mind. This meeting, this walk on the Mount of Olives was quite something. This was not some imagined walk. In fact, look at there at verse 3. Dr. Luke says, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Here, in our passage, Jesus has risen from the dead. His body, though recognizable, is different. It can go through walls. Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, is seen here in a glorified body. Can I ask you again, are you walking with the Lord? Do you take him with you? It's a wonderful, it's a captivating thing to walk with the Lord. There's only two others of our race that have been taken bodily from earth to heaven. Do you remember what it was said about Enoch? In Genesis 5, 24, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And in 2 Kings 2, 11, it says, uh, And Elijah was taken by a whirlwind to heaven. When I was 10 years old, what a thought. When I was 10 years old, there was a man who had no time for God. His name was Huxley. And he published this book. And in this book, he said, The supernatural is now being swept out of the universe in the flood of new knowledge of what is natural. It will soon be impossible for an intelligent, educated man or woman to believe in God. The God hypothesis is no longer of any pragmatic value for the interpretation or comprehension of nature. He said, God is beginning, it is beginning to resemble not a ruler, but the last fading smile of a Cheshire cat. 
Well, I have found Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Saviour, and I can testify in all my years, there's no one who's changed my life like Jesus Christ. And I can also observe that the Bible tells me, and I think you may have experienced this, apart from God, life is full of weariness and disappointment. If God is not at the center of your life, your life is full of weariness and disappointment. And then on this walk, as if that wasn't enough, look at verse 9. And when he'd spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Here is an instant of great importance. We're not told in the New Testament that they saw him rise from the dead, because the evidence of that fact could be better established by their seeing him after he was risen. But the truth of this, his ascension, could not be confirmed in that manner. So it was arranged, God arranged it, that he ascended in open day, in the presence of his apostles. And not when they were asleep or indifferent, but then when they were engaged in conversation with him. They should fix their attention. And when they were looking on him, he rose, it says. Had Jesus vanished secretly or in the night, the apostles would be amazed, confounded. Perhaps they would even have doubted whether they'd not been deceived. But when they saw him leave them in this manner, they could not doubt that he had ascended. And when they saw him ascend to heaven, they could not doubt that his work was approved and God would carry it onward. We have a choice Lean on man, well, that's simply speculation. Or lean on God's word, well, that is revelation. Philosophy says, think your way out. Indulgence says, drink your way out. Politics says, spend your way out. Science says, invent your way out. Industry says, work your way out. Communism says, strike your way out. Fascism says, bluff your way out. Militarism says, fight your way out. But the Bible says, pray. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This event was exceedingly important. It was confirmation of the truth of all that the Bible teaches it enabled the apostles to state distinctly where the Lord Jesus was and at once directed their affections and their thoughts away from the earth and opened their eyes to the glory of heaven, which is available to all to put their trust in him. Barnes puts it in his commentary, if their saviour was in heaven, it settled the question about the nature of his kingdom. It was clear that it was not designed to be a temporal kingdom, what were the reasons why it was proper for the Lord Jesus to ascend to heaven? Why? Rather than remain on earth. Well, first of all, Jesus Christ had finished his work that God had given him. Given him. It was proper that he should be received back into glory. Secondly, it was proper that he should ascend, that the Holy Spirit might come down and perform his part of the work of redemption. Jesus as a man could be in one place, but the Holy Spirit could be in many places and present at all times. And thirdly, a part of the work of Christ was not yet to be performed in heaven, and that was what he was going to, that work of intercession. The high priests of the Jews not only made an atonement, but also presented the, the blood of the sacrifice before the mercy seat. And here... He has completed his sacrifice. And here he is in heaven. And he, pro he, he produces and says that he's going to intercede for us. As it says in Hebrews 7, 25. This is properly the work which an advocate performs in a court of justice for his client. 
It means that Christ, our high priest, still pleads, still manages our cause in heaven, secures our interests, obtains for us by his grace and mercy. It consists in his appearing in the presence of God for us, in presenting the merits of his blood, securing the continuance of the mercy which has been bestowed on us, which is still needful for our welfare. Jesus Christ now is exercising that office for Donald, for me, and for you. All worlds are going to be subjected to him for the welfare of the church. And it was needful that he should solemnly be invested with that power in the presence of God as a reward for his earthly toils. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 25, he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. I find it very distressing when I read things like this. I read in the paper, in the Telegraph on the 25th of April, drunkenness is a societal problem. A study of 280,000 people in 44 countries found that here, in our country here, this had the highest level of alcohol consumption among the youngest children. That is so sad with rates higher than France or Italy. Dr. Joanna Inchley from the University of Glasgow, international coordinator of the study, said some of this could be the effects of lockdown, social lives, mental health. She said there were concerns about the use of alcohol, e-cigarettes, smoking among girls in particular, suggesting this could be linked to the mental health crisis among children who went through the pandemic. These are sad times, so sad for our children. And God has placed, and we read it in his word, he's given, he's sort of given four restraints on mankind. Four restraints. The first one really is conscience. Our conscience. God has placed that there in our heart. Our conscience tells us about certain things in our behavior. We should not do that. And then, of course, there are parents the position of a parent to bring up your child in the fear of the Lord. And then, of course, there's government. And providing government follows the word of God, that's fine. That is a restraint. But the last one is the church. And I don't mean this building. I mean the church of Jesus Christ. We are to be lights on a hill. We are to be salt we are to be the people who are pulling people, as it were, to look on God. And a cloud received him, it says. He entered into the region of the clouds and he was hid from their view. It's remarkable that when the return of the Savior is mentioned, it's often said he'll return in the clouds. This ascension, here in verse 9, was the capstone of his death and resurrection as his predicted second advent was. Each forms an unbreakable link in an inseparable chain of events. The cloud that received him was that the Shekinah glory, so often seen in the Old Testament and to be seen in his return. How long did they gaze? How long? I don't know. But we don't know, but then we read this and look at verse 10 and 11. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Two men, from the raiment of these men and the nature of their message, it seems clear to me these were angelic beings who were sent to meet and to comfort the disciples. They appeared in human form, and Luke describes them as they appeared. Angels aren't unfrequently called men. Luke 24, 4, two men stood by them in shining garments, in white apparel. 
Angels are commonly represented as being in white apparel, an emblem of purity. And the worshippers of heaven are represented as clothed in this manner. We read in Revelation, they shall walk with me in white. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white. The disciples, they'd been concerned about the coming kingdom. But they're told they'll receive power and are now instructed to, wit to be a witness to the uttermost parts of the earth. Really a reference at that time to Rome, the center of civilization. In fact, the book of Acts ends up in Rome. The Christians are to be witnesses to the ends of the world. The Jerusalem witness in chapter 2 gives us in miniature God's worldwide ministry. Look at verse 2-5. Uh, and the gentle proselytes who hear and believe carry the message far and wide. And then in chapter 3, the gospel spreads throughout Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And then chapter 8 to 12 to Antioch of Syria and finally to the ends of the world, as it were, in chapter 13 to chapter 28. And my, how they prayed. My, how these disciples prayed. When one of them was in prison, they prayed. They prayed. I came across this rather humorous, but it's got an element of truth in it. Mrs. Prayer Meeting died recently at the first neglected church in Worldly Avenue. Born many years ago in the midst of great revivals, she was a strong healthy child, fed largely on testimony and spiritual holiness, soon growing into worldwide prominence and was one of the most influential members of the famous church family. For the past several years, Sister Prayer Meeting has been in failing health, gradually wasting away. Her death was caused through lukewarmness and coldness of heart, lack of spiritual food, coupled with a lack of faith, shameless desertion and non-support were contributing causes of her death. Only a few were present at the last rites, sobbing over memories of her past beauty and power. Carefully selected pallbearers were asked to bear the remains tenderly away, but failed to appear. The body rests in the beautiful cemetery of bygone glories, awaiting the summons from above. Oh, that the Church of Jesus Christ in the United Kingdom would pray, would pray. May I ask you, are you fulfilling in your life, seeing that the gospel goes out in your community and to whom you see? But that not, is not all. Look there in verse 11. We have a promise of his return which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. The Old Testament teaches and presents the Messiah in two aspects. One is of his suffering, how he came the first time, and then of his earthly glory and power in his second coming. And if you take that verse, and Old Testament and New Testament verses, we can surmise that the return of Christ will be personal and corporal in two stages. To the air, before the tribulation. The word in 1 Thessalonians 1.14 is the Greek word harpezo, to catch up or to carry away. And then that he'll return to the earth after the tribulation. His second coming has a threefold ministry. It's to the church, it's to Israel, and it's to the nations. To the church, the descent of the Lord into the air will raise believers who have died in the past and change the living Christians is a constant expectation and hope for you and for me. To Israel, well, you can't help but read this verse 11 in, I, in uh, Acts uh, without thinking of Zechariah 14.4. And it says this, And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it towards the south. 
The second return of the Lord to the earth is to accomplish the yet unfulfilled prophecies of Israel's national regathering, conversion, and establishment in peace and power under the Davidic covenant. And the Gentile nations, well, the second return is also to the Gentile nations. The return of Christ to bring the destruction of the present political world and the judgment followed by worldwide Gentile conversion and participation in the blessings of the millennium. Oh, how wonderful my Bible is. Every day the news confirms to me what the scriptures tell me. When I look at my own life to see how he's changed me, and some of you here who testify how good God has been, how wonderful God is, a dying treasure cat, treasure cat? No. No one before or since has even fractionally approached the power of Jesus Christ. His miracles are unique. They are undeniable. They are spectacular. They are overwhelming. They are abundant. They are awesome, instant, authoritative, without limits, and total. Oh, how wonderful my Bible is. And as I come to the close of my sermon, I would just like to come back to the cross. I'd like to come back to the gospel. The crux of it. We are sinners, every one of us. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We cannot change. We cannot change our own nature. It is impossible. We can't follow a certain set of rules. Only Jesus Christ can make us new creatures in Christ Jesus. French perfumist Moriel created a signature scent for an anonymous family in the Middle East. The price of this fragrance was upward of 1.5 million US dollars. This particular bottle sold had gold armor on the bottle and had encrusted diamonds. We can no more change that old nature we have than we can take that perfume out to a farmyard and pour it on a pile of manure and make it as fragrant as a bed of roses. My friend, you and I have an old nature and you cannot change it without the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross to carry the sin of mankind, to carry Donald's sin, to carry your sin. He took it and all he asks of you is to believe him. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We read that he shed his blood. And that he bore your sin. He took the punishment you deserved and I deserved. And he did it freely for you. And like we love our boys and girls here. He loves us. He loves us. He took the punishment that you and I deserved. Did you know, wherever you go, there are cameras. Wherever you go, there's somebody watching you. Well, since you were young, all your conversation has been bugged. The whole lot of it. Everything I've ever said and ever done has been bugged by God. He knows everything. He knows everything. And yet he still loves us. And he loves you. He bore your sin. He bore the punishment and he rose from the dead, and he's gone to prepare a place for you and for me. The gospel is exclusive, and the gospel is inclusive. It is exclusive. It says in Acts 4, 9, uh, 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the way. 
Secondly, the gospel is inclusive. We have all sinned, no matter who we are. What you have done, you may come to Jesus Christ. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. This is, the, this is the morning for you to give your heart to Jesus Christ and ask him to change you and make you new. Christ has ascended. We've looked at the work he's now doing and he's given us a wonderful message. He wants us to be a witness, a witness. So the truth is, until he returns, there's business to be done. There's business to be done. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This isn't a time really to just be lazy and do nothing. Luke 9.13, he said, he said he called ten servants, he delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Matthew 5.16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Can you make sure you don't despise the scriptures? How do you not despise the scriptures? Well, number one, believe it. The second is to honor it. To honor it. The thirdly is to love it. David said in Psalms, Oh, how I love thy law. And then here is perhaps can be the greatest mockery. To obey it. To read it and obey it. When God tells us not to do something, not to be engaged in this or that sin, don't do it. To honor it. Fifthly, to fight for it. Engage yourself in the battle for truth. Proclaim it. Number six, study it. Study it. And finally, proclaim it. I'm looking round at you. Quite a lot of you, I just see you with a cup of tea in there. Or you see me with a cup of tea. You're my brother and you're my sister. This is our fellowship. Will you encourage me in the things of God? And will you let me encourage you? May we love the Lord, love one another more. Seek out for so many needs here that we may be brothers and sisters genuinely helping one another. And may we forgive one another. Forgive one another. And after this life is over, we have eternity to rejoice. And I'll share with you a personal thought. This is me. Here I am. I was on about... That atheist when I was 10, well, now I'm a little bit older. One of the things, obviously, I want, to, I want to see the Lord. I want to see him. I want to see those who have lost. And I'm going to see him again. But there's something else. How can I, how can I live for God and I see my own nature in me? I see sometimes things that have, I think, things that I do which I know are not godly. How do I correct that? That old man of mine, boy, how he gets there. And that's the beauty of Christian fellowship. We see each other's faults, we forgive one another, we grow together, and we look forward to that day when we won't have that old nature pulling us whatsoever. Whatsoever. With the Bible hid in our heart and our prayer life on our knees, we are invincible. God bless you.